We're going to look at a specific treatment of vocals and in into the lair. We got a lot of questions in the chat room and corner office on this week's Pensado Place. What's up, everybody? Welcome to This Week in Pensado's Place. I'm Dave Pensado. Uh, I'm here with my uh, co-host, Herb Trock, as always. Hey, this man. is episode 257. If you missed the other 250, just check out YouTube. Right? It's on the back of your uh, cereal box. <laughs> <laughs> Colon blow. That's right. Okay. How you doing, man? I mean, uh, you know what? I'm in a real good mood today, Herb. Good, we, good, uh, good. I took Zan and Drew and Ali out fishing yesterday, went out on the bay, caught a bunch of fish, we had a good time. Cool, cool, cool. Well, in case you want to know what kind of fish they caught, you, <laughs> can, uh, <laughs> you certainly can reach us at our Twitter handle at Pensado Place. You can email us at Pensado Place at ThisWeekend.com, go to our Facebook page, you, and you know always our live chat room, which we call the Corner Office. Powered by Ustream, and more importantly, manned by our man, Zan. Hey, guys, Zan. How you doing, man? I'm good. Hey, Herb. Did you sell the fish to buy the tie? I did. Herb, that was cool. Herb, that, this was research, the fishing trip, because as Zan pointed out on the trip, mm -hmm. now he, I don't have to give him a fish because I taught him how to fish. Ah, it was something biblical. And so in, in today's ITL, we're going to expound on that concept. Oh, and, and welcome to This Week in Religion. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I got a bulletin for you. Okay, what is it? Yeah, I just want to apologize to everybody that was tuning in to This Week in Rehab earlier on with uh, Charlie Sheen. Of course, he was replaced by Lindsay Lohan. Of course, she was replaced, and so now they're in talks with uh, Courtney Love to get the show back on the air. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. And, and listen, Drew Pinsky. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, as you can tell, we are in a silly mood today, but we're going to have a lot of fun. Dave, what's, what's on the show this week? Uh, we got uh, on Into the Lear this week. Uh, Zan and I took... Um, a session that we talked about, uh, what episode was that, Zan? Episode 5, actually. Episode, right. That quick, huh? Yeah. Episode 5, we broke down a song for you, and I just went and took uh, one of the vocals out of that session because it was fairly typical of what I do, and we broke that down for you, and that's going to be part of a continuing series uh, punctuated by a few other things. But over the next uh, four to six weeks, I'm going to try and do several ITLs on vocals because... Uh, that's probably one of the most important things we do as engineers. Okay. And then uh, um, we're going to be talking with my friend, uh, Colin McDowell from uh, McDSP. He's got a little announcement for us oh, today. Oh, very cool. We're really like excited that. about that. Colin and I have been friends for a while, one of my favorite people in the business. Great. Uh, one of the brightest, too. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. And um, then we're going to, uh, I guess we're going to go to CO after that. Absolutely. Well, why don't we uh, get it popping with Into the Lair? What do you think? Okay. We ready out there, guys? Hey everybody, welcome to End of the Lair. As promised, we're going to talk about uh, vocals today. We won't cover everything today, so what we will cover will be pretty fast-paced, try and keep up, but uh, we will go into depth depending on your questions and comments. We'll take this episode and expand it over several episodes of ITL just to uh, make sure we cover the things you want to know. Um, we're going to break down a vocal and I'm going to show you kind of some philosophical stuff about how I approach it and uh, some specific plugins. Uh, obviously the first thing we do is we check out the vocal. I'm going to play it for you raw one time. Here we go. You the weirdo. You the weirdo. Okay, we're lucky. That's, that sounds pretty good already. My friend Brent did a good job on that. Um, one of the things I listen for is uh, the S's, the S's that on this are pretty good, so we're not going to have to really worry about that too much, although I'll show you a couple of ways I deal with that. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind is um, it's tracked really well. It's not over-compressed. Uh, we're lucky. The S's, uh, there's a couple of ways to approach those. Shouty, you the weirdo. Shouty, you the weirdo. In Pro Tools, S's always look like little footballs, so you can see how, you can see how this is got space and this little compact thing would be an S. One of the things I do with S is I just draw them down. Uh, so this would be Shouty you the weirdo. Now if we if we if we want to uh, use a DS or we you know that's a whole different story. But uh, I'm gonna nuke this for now. We're gonna come back to that. 
this is a an, an equalizer that uh, that I had used on this. I'm gonna get rid of this. So right now, what we're hearing is this, just a little compression. Now, first thing that I want to do is is add a little super top, and then add a, a get those S's a little sparkly. So here we go. And then, and then, because of of there's there's guitars in this track. Remember, we use this track in uh, episode what, Zan three? Two or three. Yeah. Two or three. Yeah. Um, um, I'm gonna add a little bit of guts to compete with with what's in the track. Shouty, you the weirdo. Shouty. And then uh, a little bit lower. Shouty, you the weirdo. Shouty. I might be adding too much of this. We're gonna pull that back a little. Of the two and a half k. Shiny you the weirdo without these two. Shiny you the weirdo. Don't think of those as frequencies, think of those as energy. That uh that one K to three K range is is to me that's the power, that's the energy. That's where you're gonna be able to compete with other things in the track. The the upper stuff, the ten K, fifteen K in this case, ten K, that's your finesse. That's 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 that that uh classiness. And then the low end, if you're doing a rock song, you probably want a little less low end than what I'm going to use. But I, I, I'm, 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 I'm using on this song, as you remember from last time, a lot, a lot more low end than you might find on a typical rock song. So we might need to enforce that. So we're going to do a little 200 and a little, a little 100. Shouty, you the weirdo. Shouty, you the weirdo. Okay, now here's without it. The second... You can sure use the weirdo, sure use the weirdo. The second time I'm gonna bring the EQ in. First time without it. Shouty you the weirdo, shouty you the weirdo. Damn, I'm good. All right. Um. Now, uh, I get asked a lot. Do you compress before uh, your EQ or after your EQ? Uh, what I like to do. Now, everybody does things a little bit different, so. There's no hard, hard rules about this. Um, I like to do my cuts before my compressor. Now, in this case, I'm not going to do that. But uh, normally, if I've got a, a vocal that doesn't sound good, I'll cut before the compressor so that my frequencies that are sticking out won't control the compressor. And then I like to boost after the compressor. In this case, this vocal is recorded so well, we're not going to do too much cutting. It's just all boost, if, as you can see. And... Um, um, the compressor I'm using for, 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 for illust uh, to illustrate this is the uh, Fairchild. So now we're going to add that without it. Shiny, you the weirdo. With it. Shiny, you the weirdo. Now this compressor has a lot of the stuff chosen for us. On the attack time, um, you want a slow enough attack time to where the initial transients get through and they're not really affecting the compressor that much normally and then set your release time for the time of the song and I usually use a ratio of three to one, four to one and then uh, that should get you in the ballpark and then you can adjust it based on on the song itself. Um, we'll do a whole ITL on just how to set up compressors for vocals soon. After this compressor I just felt like um, I needed just a little more control so just, let's just check out our buddy. This is optional. Like, Closing in a nudist camp. Clothing optional. Just, just kind of smooths it out a little bit. I'm gonna take this off for now, um, just because I want to show you something. Okay. Now we can take those S's down a little bit with a de-esser. Or, what I like to do is I like to draw them down, so, so we'll... So what we'll do is, uh, we'll, we'll expand it to where we, we, we really notice um, the S's really stand out, no S, oh, there's an S. So we'll pull that back a little, and so... Okay, you with me so far? This is where you say, yeah, 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 Dave, Drew. 
Yeah, Dave. Okay, great. Just checking. Got to keep Drew awake sometimes. Um, now, as far as levels, um, we've got two choices. We can start by putting the loudest part of our vocal where we want it and then bring the low parts up, or we can put the low parts where we want it, bring the high parts down, or a combination. I tend to find a, a spot where the vocal just sits good in the track for me personally. It's a good starting spot. So let's pretend like, like this is sitting good. So what I would probably do is, uh, I would rough it in without even really listening to it. So let's pull, let's pull this up. This, I know this is probably jumping out a little bit at me. I like the shorties because that's the name of the song. So let's pull this back a little. Now on this one, we'll, a lot of times what I'll do is, is something like this. And here again, a lot of this is personal taste. I got, I, I've, I've seen it done all which way. So, so now we've got. Shouty, you the weirdo. Shouty, you the weirdo. Okay, hear that? Let's hear it without it real quick. Shouty, you. Shouty, you the weirdo. Shouty, you the weirdo. I won't say it's, it's better or worse, but that's, that's, the, that's the approach that you would take. Um, if it were me personally, I probably wouldn't go as strong as I just did in the song, because I, I like a little bit of dynamics. Uh, some people would probably go as strong as what you saw me do there. Now, let's, let's go into some effects and, and why we're choosing them. That vocal sounds good to me, so like I said earlier uh, in a... In a in an episode, I can't remember what it was, it was either, maybe I didn't say it at all, so I'll say it again. Sometimes I think of um, panning allows me to go left and right, and I think of reverb allows me to pan front to rear. If someone is standing in the back of, gym, of, an, a, gym, of a gymnasium and yells at you, your ear is sophisticated enough to take into account all that information, and they know that person is far away, and then as it gets closer, the early reflections um, change. So. Let's try the, um, uh, this is like a little delay. Let's try that. Shouty, you the weirdo. Hear that? Okay, a little bit of that. That sounds good. Um, now this is, a, um, this is something that I made up that I use a lot to kind of get width. We're going to discuss, we're going to have a whole show on width at some point. Um, and uh, what I do is I take, a delay unit. This one works good. Uh, our, our BPMs are 138. Uh, if you'll notice, for some reason, this likes to be out of phase. Just a tiny bit of feedback, and um, I feed that into um, the plug-in center, and I remove pretty drastically the the, the middle information. And uh, this preset. Uh, was inspired by Dylan Dresdo, who made me promise I wouldn't give it away, but sorry, Dylan. Um, I modified it so I can give it away. Nah, Dylan didn't say that. Dylan shares everything. This is kind of a cool thing. Um, the original harmonizer had a little quirk that it was very unstable. If you'll notice, this is blinking uh, no pitch shift and um, uh, one cent pitch shift. So what I do is I deselect it from being um, um, left and right chained together. So the, my left side, I'm doing this. Now my right side, I'm doing just the opposite. I'm blinking from 99 up so to 100. So when one's going sharp, the other one's doing something flat. And it gives me a pretty cool vibe. So this I'm not even using. So let's hear how that sounds. Shouty, you the weirdo. Shouty, you the weirdo. Shouty, you the weirdo. Cool, huh? The harmonizer kind of winds it. The center takes it out of the center, and then the delay kind of keeps that neat little vibe going. Um, you'll like that. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to add a little reverb. Shouty, you the weirdo. Shouty, you the weirdo. The way you do that, the bitch got a. 
Shawty, you the weirdo. Shawty, you the weirdo. The way you do that dance, gotta. Does this ever happen to you where you hit Pro Tools and it doesn't go back to where you started? What is that, Apple N? Just in, yeah, just in. Here we go. So now, now it sets us back. Shawty, you the weirdo. All right. That sounds good. Now let's check them all three together. Cool. So we've gotten a little width. We made it a little wider. We've put it in a space. We've made that space kind of wide. If you, if you, if you for you Bricasti fans, that's large hall on the Bricasti, and then uh, a little bit, of, a couple of delays. The issue of how much effects to use. It's a personal taste thing, uh, and and, it's, and as we said earlier, that amount of effects can be a fad thing. We're in a, a delay laden, pretty dry, pretty wet phase of uh, of the music world. In the early 90s it was just the opposite. No reverb on anything. And if you if you want to get your vocal drier then the, then the approach we used with the, the, the dual 910s and that delay, uh, that would be an approach to take on a drier vocal. If you want the vocal a little wetter then, then use more reverbs. But for dry I like choruses, pitch shifts, and uh, delays. We touched on this earlier. If, if, you're, if you're doing a rock song, you probably want a, a little less reverb, keep the vocal up front, because the vocal has to compete with a lot of mid-range information, so we'll cut off a little more low end of that than we normally would. And then this vocal has to do both. It has to compete with live drums, if you remember. Uh, the original session we showed you it has to compete with program drums, so we did kind of a full range version of this. I've talked to some friends of mine and we're probably going to have uh, a couple of guys that, that are going to give you some really good pointers on pretty soon about how they record and track vocals, their, uh, their chain, the equipment they use and why. So look for that in the future and then um, uh, a little later on uh, maybe episode two or three from now, we'll get into kind of something that I think is kind of fun and placing vocals and how you sit those in the mix, that sort of thing. I, I got to find a song we can use as a as an example because, um, like I said earlier in another episode, most of the things I do are are, are records and people you know, I have to get permission and all that, but. Uh, these guys have just been really so sweet about letting me use this track. I really appreciate it. So, next time. Cool. All right, guys. Um, I mentioned that um, that we had gone over the song that that particular vocal was from uh, in previous episodes. That was episode three and five. We split that segment into two episodes. On episode three, uh, you'll find the website where that, that particular finished song is. And then... Um, all the information pertinent to that song. But a uh, big shout out to Mr. Midwest and to Brent and all my guys over there. Um, <clears throat> one little thing I wanted to um, point out, the, 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 the technique I used where I split the harmonizer into left and right, I, I unlinked it. Uh, that's a cool thing to do with a lot of delays, a lot of stuff you can do that and create uh, some pretty interesting effects. You don't always have to have a, a a delay stereo, and that's that. We're going to cover that in another segment soon. But uh, you know, load it up as a as a uh, what's it called multi mono. Mm -hmm. Load it up as a multi mono, and then select both sides. All right, coming up right now, uh, I've got a, a special treat for you guys. My friend Colin uh, McDowell from McDSP is going to uh, come by and say hello to us. We're skyping him in from. Uh, the upper part of our fair state herb. Absolutely. And I know you've been anxious to see this all week. Absolutely. And Colin, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome. Dave Pensado, you're on the computer. Yeah, Hi. I know, I know, I know. Uh, among other things I'm on, but uh, uh, I talked to you earlier in the week and you said you had a surprise for me. What is that, Colin? Well, um, you know, we've had this 6030 Ultimate Compressor, another compressor plug-in for Pro Tools, which I'm highly biased about. But, uh, well, we thought for your show that we'd offer this special, or if people go to our website, mcdsp.com, and order the product or any other mcdsp product, 
We'd give them 50 bucks off. They just typed in Pensado. That's P-E-N. All right. Round of applause for Colin, guys. Right. Cool, cool. Thank you, Colin. Okay. Um, other than that, you can see I, I almost shaved. I'm trying to grow a, a cool beard like Zan, but he's the <laughs> good-looking guy, and I'm just the dorky guy. <laughs> hey, yeah, we got to stick together as, uh, as geeks. You know what I'm saying? Fair enough, Mr. Pensado. Yeah. Hey, shout out to Ralph while, uh, while we're talking to everybody. One more well, favor. Uh, repeat, repeat what they need to do to get the $50 discount. Oh, sure, Dave. Um, go to mcdsp.com, mcdsp.com, and just order from our online store. And in the coupon code section, when you check out, just type in Pensado, P-E-N-S-A-D-O, and you'll get 50 bucks off your purchase. That could be for the 6030 or any other McDSP product. We, remember that, that we said if you type in Zan, you have to pay an extra $50. Remember? So if you want to. Oh, right. Yeah. And that <laughs> oh, does not go to charity either. <laughs> hey, Colin, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, can you give us uh, an update on some of the new things that you're doing? As you know, and let me remind our viewers that I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of your product line. We've been working together since the mid 90s. And uh, um, you and Waves are the, one, are the two companies that no matter what you guys make, it's always great. I don't have to call Dylan and ask what he's doing with it or Jay or anybody. Your stuff is always incredible. And um, so I'm sure you got something in the pipeline or is there something uh, about an older product that you've updated that you want to discuss? How's version five coming along, by the way? Oh, okay. Well, that's probably a good thing to talk about. Uh, version five is doing good. Uh, McDSP has been exclusive to Pro Tools for the last like, 12 years. But um, as of December 2010, we finally ported all our products to audio units. Um, there's lots of customers who create content and do other things on other platforms besides Pro Tools. And so, by golly, we'd like them to use our plugins too. Some of them might be even as talented as you, Dave. But, um, <laughs> Thanks, man. see how that goes. Uh, I want to point out also to our viewers that Colin is going to be a guest uh, real soon where he'll be in the studio with us and we'll be taking a lot of your uh, questions, comments, suggestions, and, and Colin is one of those manufacturers that does pay attention to what his clients say and want, and um, like I said, I, I've never gotten a product from him that wasn't immensely usable. Well, Colin, we've really had a great time talking with you, and uh, I tell Ralph I'll hook up with him and we'll get your flight scheduled and uh, um, get all that organized so in, a, in a few weeks where you can come down and uh, spend a little time with us in person. I'd love, I'd love to hear um, your take on your plugins in, ter in terms of, because I know you're a musician, and, and I'd like to hear how you actually use your own stuff. And, and then there's, you know, the internet is, is, is a wild place. There's, there's things buzzing around. Have you, have you answer a few of those things, set some rumors straight? Um, have Colin, and what's the website that folks can go to for? Oh, the website's mcdsp.com, right, Colin? That's right. Yeah, and Perfect. don't forget that Zan Nakari discount, or actually extra pay. That's a penalty. <laughs> That's not a discount. That's what do you get? Hey, what do you get if you type in Herb Trowick? Um, uh, boy. Uh, Come on, Colin. I don't know, actually. Come on, Colin. We well, just met. What if you type in Dylan Dresdo? What do you get? Um, probably an almost as good discount as Dave Pensado, but just a little bit shorter. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. My goodness. I love you, Colin. Hey, man, listen, thank you so much. Thanks, Colin. We really appreciate oh, this. You. And uh, kudos to our staff for setting this up. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, you, Colin. Bye, Dave. Cool. That was fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great guest, great energy, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I, called, uh, I called Will about... 30 minutes ago and said, hey, man, can you set this up? But Will's, <laughs> Will's magical. Will can do anything. I know. Will walks on water. I know. Here's the cool part, in that the chat room has exploded with questions for the guests and so on and so forth. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we get into the corner office right now? Let's do it. Cool. So we're back. Zan, we uh, loaded up? Yes, we are. I've got a question that's really popular. It's uh, being asked again today by Ravian in the chat room. Um, a, He's asking if you could talk a little bit about the rule of thirds as it applies to mixing. Yeah, Rivian? Yes. Oh, I think I saw, I think I saw, he's, he's quite asked us a few things. I forget where he's from. He's from an interesting place. Um, anyway, Rivian, thanks thing. for calling, uh, or thanks for uh, getting online and coming to us. Um, um, I'm going to do, 
I'm going to do a series of Into the Layers on the relationship between the visual world and the audio world because I think they're 100% connected. I'll give you a taste right now. I, I think that creativity is creativity. The way that it manifests itself, whether it be in mixing or pottery or, or carpentry or uh, painting, whatever, sculpture, I think there's, there's enough similarities to where we can study any particular medium and walk away with useful insight into our own audio world. And the rule of thirds is just a small, tiny part of that. And um, what I can say is, is, is um, go ahead and do a little research before we get to that because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an advanced subject, but I really feel strongly that um, there's a lot of validity there. I've, I've had a lot of successful seconds that worked for me that have gone on to be even more successful and part of it is I think because of uh, these kind of philosophies in other words the teaching to fish as opposed to giving a fish so we're, good question we're going to get into that soon uh, as okay well, I got one from Jeremy do you have any recommendations or preference on how to prepare a session before it's sent for mixing do's and don'ts Every, every engineer is different. Uh, in the future, we're going to have a, a, bit, a bit of a roundtable discussion with, with uh, probably four or five engineers. And if, if you can keep an ear out for that show, uh, bring up that question again, because you'll get a different answer from each one of us. Uh, I do have a preference, and I did an ITL on that preference. Uh, take a look at that, and if you still have a question, we'll answer it when we hit to the round, roundtable show. Uh, I've got one from Rolling Cube. Um, he's referring to when John Marie was here. He mentioned something about adding distress to the mix in various places. Um, can you talk oh, about that? Oh, the distressor. Um, a lot of my friends, uh, Michael Brower loves the distressor. Um, John Marie loves the distressor. The, the distress, <laughs> distressor. Uh, English wasn't my third language. Um, someone told me recently that that's probably the the biggest selling compressor in the modern modern time uh, David Bryce my friend told me that I think I think he said it's like 20,000 units or something and the reason is it's really it it, it, it represents the modern form of equipment that that, that is multifunctional like in, in in the in the 60s 50s 70s uh, a compressor did one thing the beauty of the distressor is it can do multiple things and do them all extremely well so what he was talking about was he probably, I'm guessing what he t was talking about was he uses that compressor on vocals, on drums, to mix. Uh, as I've said several times, go to Michael Brower's website and read, read how he uses the distressor. It's a great, 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 great unit. As is the Fatso, by the way. I love the Fatso. Speaking of David Bryce, I think David represents that company now. I've got a question from Oliver B. Uh, for live drums, do you prefer using room mics or prefer to create a fictional room sound with reverb. I tend to approach live drums pretty much the same way I approach dead drums. Um, and I was thinking about my joke and completely missed the question. <laughs> Herb, don't give me that look. I'm so sorry. I'm so enjoying your humor. Herb, is, as you guys know, Herb is a class act, and, and I don't know what he's doing on this show, and, and I've ruined his credibility. In fact, I think I think I, I think my show is so bad I've affected his credit score. <laughs> but anyway, what was the question again, Sam? For live drums, do you prefer using room mics or to create a fictional room sound with reverb? I prefer, uh, in live drums, I prefer to get as much done right in the recording process as possible. I, uh, as, when I was starting out, I heard a, a rumor or a story that John Bonham, the drummer from Zeppelin, only allowed two mics on his entire drum kit, an, one overhead and one in front of the kick drum, and, the, and through his headphones, he played, uh, he mixed himself th through what he heard through his headphones from those two mics, and, and that, that really stuck with me, and I think the reason that works is because um, I said earlier on one episode, I think it was like episode 257, that a drum kit is one instrument and when you put 15 mics up you're going to introduce phase relationships so the more mics you use the, 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 the more you lose but the more you gain if you're doing it correctly so um, I try to get as much right in the, in the recording process and one little quick thing I haven't mentioned I really think it's important to have somebody come by and tune the drums that knows how to tune drums 
I, I could I could expound on that, but I'm not. Uh, a question from Richard Gass. Because in the of you, Herb, and I tripped <laughs> home the other day. Oh, okay, no problem. A question from Richard in the, the chat room wants to know, um, you, he'd like to hear your take on how to replace reverbs with um, short delays to create sort of the same effect for depth okay. and that sort of thing. Um, gosh, I, I wish I was more prepared. There was an engineer, the guy that did Addicted to Love with uh, Robert Palmer, I forget his name, but uh, he was he used delays as as opposed to reverbs uh, as good as anybody's. And can can we maybe get give a graphic up on that or get you some info on that? Um, what you try to do is reverb uh, tricks the mind into thinking that uh, because of the way that two ears hear sound coming. Uh, at different times, it, it, uh, and, and that, that technique of the ear helps the ear place things within a, a room or a building. We mentioned the gymnasium thing earlier, and um, um, delays don't do that. So think a little bit about that concept, and you'll find the answer to the question in that concept, because you're not creating a space with delays, you're, you're creating uh, more like yelling into a canyon kind of thing. Uh, in other words, uh, when you shoot a gunshot near a canyon, you hear, you know. Well, part of that is reverb and part of that is delay, and you figure, you figure that out. You'll, 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 you'll answer yourself, and hit me up next week if you don't. Ooh. I've got a question for her from Illis Vendetta in the chat room. Um, it has to do with management. Can you elaborate the need or importance and services that a manager can provide for a producer or mixer? Um, it's a good question. Thanks for it. Um, Malcolm Gladwell popularized a term called the tipping point. And there's a tipping point where you need a manager and sometimes you don't. Um, a lot of that is a very personal kind of set of criteria because it depends on the person that you're representing. Some people want people to collect money, some people want them to find jobs, some people need marketing, some people need structure. So I personally look at anything creative as something that needs to be left alone to flourish. And so I personally believe, it's a personal philosophy, that in Dave's case, who I do represent, um, when he's mixing, he doesn't need to be cluttered with other things so he can focus on what he's doing. Um, so we've worked out the criteria that he needs. That might be different for somebody else. So it's a little bit about knowing the client. It is, it is really observing the rules of a relationship. And when you have a good relationship, then you tailor make yourself to that person and you move forward. It's not for everybody, and don't assume that you can't work without having a manager, but there does come a point where having a manager will increase your ability to do good work and, and where you're working. Uh, I want to expound on that because this is important. Herb, Herb once told me, <clears throat> first of all, you need something to manage before you need a manager. And then secondly, there's an art, like Herb said, there's an art to managing and then there's also an art to being managed. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Elvis Presley was managed by Colonel Tom Parker, and Colonel Tom Parker, his commission was 50%. He took half of everything Elvis made, is the rumor. Is that true? That's the rumor. That's the rumor. Mm -hmm. And Elvis was reported to have said that, that he's a bargain at, at that. So good management is um, invaluable, and, uh, but there's also good clients. And so just want to toss that in here. I'm going to kind of segue into another... Uh, management question from Milterson. Um, how do you get mixing management, like as a mixer? How do you go about getting a manager? That's a great question. Yeah, and I, I think from my perspective, um, everything in the arts is about some research. Um, you can go online oftentimes, find out how to contact people, see who represents them, go to their websites. Um, oftentimes you're emulating I used to say what you have to do is you have to emulate success. I, I used to hold up certain kinds of business people in the, in the art world and I said, I like the way he's become successful. What was his path and could I, could I create that? It's not necessarily an original art form. It's how you put your spin on what it is, but the fundamentals are the same. So I'd say A, research it. Um, oftentimes managers are passionate people 
who, who you know and trust and are willing to learn and they're smart. It's, it's not an exact science. Uh, Dave said something interesting. You, there needs to be something to manage first because there's nothing more frustrating than you get this relationship going and nothing is happening. You start to blame each other and it starts to spiral down before it takes off. Uh, but again, research, go through. There's plenty of guides out there. There's plenty of ways to find out who does what. Herb, I have a question for you. Yep. In terms of management, maybe we could do it in terms of percentages. What, what percentage of your responsibility is to get your client work and what percentage is your responsibility to manage the work he has? Because most people that do what I do want management because their career is going downhill, they don't have enough work, or they're just coming into the profession and want work. Want, uh, is that something that they should look for in a manager or is that something that they should how, how, what's your thoughts on that? Well, that's where the tipping point comes into play. If you're busy and you're swamped, it might be a manager who knows how to put that organization together, keep it rolling, get it out of your way, mm -hmm. and make sure structurally things are going but, on that but, makes but sense. But the kid, the kid coming along that's trying mm -hmm. to get work, is management a, a way to get work, or should they look at management as something different? Uh, I, I would say that they should focus on being good first. And if they're good first and they get into good situations and make good relationships, managers may find them at that point in time because it's really difficult to manage somebody who's not very good. Well, I, I get phone calls all the time. Dave, do you know a good manager? And I always say, you mean do I know somebody that can get you work? And they go, well, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a tougher situation. It's not that it's, that's part of the manager's world, but it can be tougher if you're, if you're breaking somebody that nobody knows or their work is not very good and, and you set up a false premise that doesn't that falls apart before it can even move forward. I got a question for you. I know you're gonna on the ride home today. You're gonna. <laughs> what's your take on on the current trend of A and R people becoming managers? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, it, it's not so current. It's been around for a while. But uh, now it's overt. <laughs> it, it's it, that's just part part of the business. Um, it, it's a mixed it's a mixed bag. Um, what it means is there are clicks that are hard to get into unless that person's managing you. If you get into them, it can be consistent work, it can be high profile work and work that builds your career. Um, you have to know who you're getting in bed with mm -hmm. because some are better than others, some take it more seriously than others. There's a group of people who just see it as making money. Mm -hmm. And so they're doing things because they have a certain amount of control and so on and so forth. It seems like it seems like lately that's not the general case. It seems like in the in the nineties that person, that A and R person that became management, was trying to increase their income. It seems like now, a lot of the guys are just trying to get more control and and, and have a camp ready made that they can go to. Is that do you think that's an accurate assessment? Oh, um, yeah, and I'm not sure that that's a, there's a differentiation between that and making money, mm -hmm. because the control factors and so on and so forth. It's having a camp that will be loyal to you, will take on what you want, that you can control and deduce. Mm -hmm. And by the way, sometimes really great work comes out of that too. Mm -hmm, yeah. like, it's not all bad, it's mm -hmm. just a different model and you have to have, you have to be set for that model if you want to because it can be pretty restrictive. Mm -hmm. um, there are other guys who, like yourself and other guys who, who are in demand and, and part of what makes them special is their independence. So it depends. Um, and that it's a shifting place, and it's a new area where all of a sudden yeah. these cliques and these camps it used to not be that way, but yeah. but it's been around for a while now. Cool, thanks, sir. You're welcome. We've got a question from uh, Rico for Mix. What's your average work week? How many songs do you mix a week, and how long do you spend on a song on average? Uh, I mix. Um, man, I had a funny answer, but I'm not I'm not going to go that way, Rico. Um, for me, I, I'm a little slower than the average uh, mixer. Um, I usually spend anywhere from if it's if it's just a few tracks and if it's a, a rap song I can do those in about eight to ten hours. A really complex pop song I, it might take me eighteen hours, and then the bulk of them I, I tend to finish in a day. I actually try not to finish them in a day because <clears throat> I think I do my best work when I can get all the heavy lifting done on day one and then come back on day two for three or four hours and do some tweaks. Uh, I, um, uh, Lady Marmalade, if you remember that, that hit I had, that was a 12-day mix <laughs> for a lot of various reasons, the, the least of which were mine, but uh, it can vary all over the place. What was the second part of the question? Just on average, how many songs a week, how long do you spend? You, you, you were touching on a lot yeah. of that stuff. I tend to work every day, Rico, um, and I feel that doing so is actually an asset. Um, I've discussed this with some of, some of the 
my friends that do what I do. And um, when a basketball player takes some time off, Herb can expound on this, being the Laker fan that you are. Mm. Uh, you're still a Laker fan, right? Big time. Uh, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, um, <laughs> when you when you take some time off, it takes you a minute to get back up to game speed, and I'm firmly convinced that happens in the mix world. The more you mix, the better you get at it. And I like to work every day because I just it, it's just a flow and a vibe. And and after I've been working like two or three straight weeks, I, I, I get a little anxious to go fishing when the when the reports are good or prospecting or you know go dirt biking or whatever. But uh, I love doing this, so I don't really note the time or. A, anything other than the fact that I just really enjoy doing it. But good question, Rico. Last question of the day. Last question. All right. Um, for rap vocals, how do you handle double takes um, when they double track, when you mix? Oh, we call it stacking the vocals. Uh, first of all, I get, the, I get the main vocal sounding as good as I can. And then, like, let's say there's a shortage of a little rounder bottom or something like that. If the double is actually a double that goes all the way through, I'll try and use the deficiencies in, uh, of, of what I'm hearing in the main track and try and bring some of that out in the, in the double. I, I compress the double way more. Uh, I try to keep the mud out of the double and only use it to enhance the, uh, the frequencies that I want to um, hear more of in the, in the main vocal. And I, I make sure that the, the sibilances uh, say sibilance, sir. Sibilance. I make sure that they're not. <laughs> I make sure that they're not being doubled by the double vocal, and then um, I think we reviewed a song the other day, and I said it was a really good use of, of a double vocal. Tupac was probably uh, one of the best at it. Uh, I, I had the pleasure of being around him for several sessions, and uh, a lot of those doubles he 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 did. He wrote it, did it, and doubled it, and his doubles were so tight that they became a, a, another effect. Um, I'll try and expound more on that in one of the uh, vocal sessions, but I think I gave you enough to start on. So, time flies. we got to get out of here. Man. Remember, guys, you can catch us at all the usual places, Twitter at Pensado Place, our Facebook page, email Pensadoplace at thisweekend.com. Uh, thanks for coming to the corner office and our man Zan doing our thing. We absolutely want to thank Colin for joining us. Yay. You can link to the McDSP website at our blog and at YouTube. We'll have that up shortly, so make sure you go there. Uh, great stuff, great product, great people. And um, uh, back to you, my man. Okay. Get out of here. And um, don't forget, Colin, my friends at Wave sent me uh, a new Aural Exciter this week. Be sure and check that out. And one little thought to leave you with. I was just realizing today on the way over what a wonderful support network I have. What I mean is uh, the other day I was having trouble with a bass line. I hit up uh, Jay and asked, asked him what his opinions were. He gave me some just uh, great input. Uh, I talked to Dylan a lot. We talk about gear. We keep each other updated. Um, we, we, when we have problems, we can iChat. Uh, the other day Dylan uh, through iChat, took my computer over and fixed a problem for me at, 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 in the morning. So anyway, get a network, get some people that you trust, get people at your level, a couple people above your level, and, 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 and don't make it a solo sport. Make it a, make it a team effort. Have a support staff with you. Get guys like Herb in your life, Zan, Sean, uh, Drew. Get guys like that in your life, all my engineering buddies, and I, I promise you your, your career will, will, will take off much faster. Cool. Um, uh, I guess that's about it. So I, I hate to say goodbye, trying to stretch this as long as I can. I, I really love uh, talking to you guys about this stuff, but we got to run next week. <laughs>